Well, I want to talk to you tonight a little bit, and, and you're here for one instance to hear about lap band surgery, but I need to talk to you about the whole process of obesity before we do any of that so you understand how important it is. Um, there's a lot of things you'll hear in the news, a lot of things you'll hear uh, outside the newspapers, TV shows, fad diets, diets, weight loss centers, other places, other things. And now, they just introduced me as a bariatric surgeon, and really in the bariatric community, we're trying to get away from the term of weight loss surgeon. We're not a weight loss surgeon. We're actually a metabolic surgeon. We, we change the metabolism so that you lose weight on your own. So it's a little bit different than what it sounds like. It's not just, we do surgery, you lose weight type thing. But you have to understand a couple of concepts about obesity before you actually can really understand where you are in this picture. Uh, one of the things that we will talk about tonight is body mass index. Each one of you has a little wheel that's out there in your stuff, and you can calculate your body mass index. Body mass index looks at your height and your weight and calculates an index number that you will fall into to tell you if you're overweight, underweight, or obese. Now, you can see here on the, the slide, normal weight is anyone that's around 18.5 BMI to 24.9. You get into the overweight category at 25 to 29.9, you go into what we consider obese. This is the definition of obesity in the United States, and it is the definition really of obesity across the country, I mean across the world now, excuse me. Well, what we really get into is the, where the major, major health problems are obviously evident is in the severe obesity here and the morbidly obese here. Uh, but you can see these crop up in this area here now, and I'll talk about a couple of things about qualifying for surgery and qualifying for certain uh, plans, if you will, uh, when you get into these areas here. But, you know, we used to think, golly, morbidly obesity has is, is got to be where we stop. About four years ago to five years ago, we coined another phrase, the super morbidly obese, where you get into the BMIs of 55 or greater, and we see those every day. I can't tell you, it's not, we don't see just this area here or this area here. We see on under the spectrum on the other side here. Um, talking about qualification, we're going to use some of these numbers, so I'll, I'll use a good bit of that in, in my talk. So if you want to calculate yours, not to tell me, not to tell anybody or your friends, just so know where you are because your risk of dying and everything goes higher and your costs go higher as you have this. Well, if you look at obesity in Georgia in general, um, we have the 22nd worst BMI in the country. Great, that means there's a few people below us, right? Um, but if you break it up into counties, okay, in the metro areas up here in Atlanta, you have Augusta and things, Savannah over here, uh, Columbus over here. But if you look in this area right through here, traditionally what we call the Bacon Belt, um, and you know, you've heard the Bible Belt, well, this is the Bacon Belt. <laughs> If you look down here, right around, this is Thomas County, right here in the orange. We're surrounded by three counties out of four that are in red. And these counties actually have obesity in the percentages of 31 to 38 percent of the population is morbidly obese. This is the problem. And so if you take some of our counties, we're actually heavier if you just look at it on a county basis than the heaviest state in the country, which is Mississippi. And so there's where our problem is, and this is where we get all of our health associated problems here that we treat here at Archibald. Well, if you go back and look now and talk about obesity and how it has become on the forefront in the last 15, you know, really the last five years, but really in the last 15 years. Now I can remember probably in high school, I think one of my mother's friends had a gastric stapling operation. Didn't know what it was, didn't care at that point, didn't have any idea of how it would affect my life. But that was an exception. That's the only person I think I ever heard of, really until I was in college, that had this type of operation done. Uh, but obesity has passed smoking as the greatest health risk according to the last Surgeon General in the country. And it has, because of all the comorbid problems, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. On average, an obese individual lives seven years less. Now let's think about the economics of life. If you, you know, how many of you can tell me your earliest memories really before age five? Or, you know, really if you accomplished a lot of things before age seven or eight? Those were your early years, and that's understandable. 
But what happens is we tend to die in our late years, our, our years that we want to enjoy. We have family, we have friends, we have grandchildren, we have other people we want to be with, we have <coughs> excuse me, other things that we want to do in life, and those are robbing our later years. So these are the more productive years, the years that we ultimately want, but we ultimately give up to our disease process called obesity. A severe obesity individual will live 10 years less than average. So you're talking on average right now for a normal weight person in the United States, the average life expectancy for a woman is around 76 years of age. You're talking about dying at age 66. And then you start talking about looking at retirement age. And if they're moving retirement age up, a lot of people aren't going to get to retirement age anymore before they're dying or becoming disabled from the disease and ultimately dying of their disability. <coughs> Excuse me. Obesity has a number of comorbid problems, and I've already mentioned that word comorbid, if you will, that go along. These are processes that go along with obesity or other medical conditions. Diabetes, of course, being number one. This is where we kind of out-eat our body, if we will, and out-eat our pancreas' ability to produce insulin or use insulin, so we go on to develop type 2 diabetes. Um, of course, heart disease, but other things you don't think about. Hypertension, increased risk of cancer, especially breast cancer and colon cancer. Uh, sleep apnea, which increases your risk of stroke by 30%. Uh, reflux disease, other things you think don't think about is orthopedic issues. Capital Regional uh, Health Plan down in Tallahassee um, two months ago, I think, or either six weeks ago, changed their plan. So anyone with a BMI over, I believe, 30 or maybe 32 is no longer qualified to have total knee or total hip replacement until they lose weight. Instantaneously, the orthopedic groups down in Tallahassee became the largest referrer to the Tallahassee, um, one of the Tallahassee uh, obesity clinics because they can't get anybody qualified for those surgeries anymore because health plans are starting to catch up with this. It costs half of what a total knee operation, one total knee operation costs to do this kind of surgery, one half of it. And you can go on and maybe not even need your total knee replacement. Uh, but it creates a significant financial burden on us as individuals, but also the healthcare system. And when you think of it as us, because the largest provider of healthcare in the United States is the U.S. government, and a lot of people who cannot work or et cetera go on to government assisted medical care, it is putting the burden on every one of us and on the economy and causing us significant issues uh, that we're dealing with right now in our, in our society. Well, causes of obesity, everybody thinks it's just you're eating too much food. And that's not always the right way to look at it. Sure, there's increase in consumption, but really in refined foods. I was talking earlier with a couple of women in the front about the use of processed sugars and things and how it causes a, a real quick sugar surge. And what we feel in our brain is a dopamine surge, which causes us to feel happy, almost euphoric, almost like a drug. And all of a sudden that falls away and you get this low blood sugar, which you want to immediately crave more sugar. So it's a dependency on sugar. And another paper published last year in the Journal of Obesity Surgery um, showed that the leptin and ghrelin receptors, which are hormones in our brain that, that figure out satiety for us, were actually abnormal in a person who was obese that lost down to a normal weight, but they were abnormal for up to two years afterwards. So it's a significant problem. So when you lose the weight, you're not cured at that point. It is a chronic disease of obesity. Of course, decrease in activity, psychological issues, genetics play a part in it. You know, if you have someone that's larger in your family, your mother or father, you're more prone to be uh, large in your own family. Psychological factors, of course, certain medications increase weight. Um, there's actually chemotherapy drugs out now that actually cause you to gain weight as opposed to lose weight. Uh, food cravings, of course. Um, People have certain binges they go on to eat certain things. Well, the problem with diets, and of course we talked about those a few minutes before the, the program started, long-term diets all have similar results. This is proven in multiple different studies, but really only about 5 to 8% will have long-term success. And really, all honesty, it's only about 8% of people who can keep weight off for a period of two years or greater. Uh, rapid weight loss from certain diets has not been shown to be uh, long-term. And really, 
um, a lot of people will rebound after that. If you lose a lot of weight on a rapid weight loss plan, you'll come back, and when you start to gain weight, you'll actually gain more. So you'll seesaw up higher weight at that point, which is really not good for your cholesterol levels, your triglyceride levels, because those spike and then, and then go up even higher. Um, but even modest weight loss, 5 to 10%. I mean, if you're in a 300-pound individual, you're only talking really about 30 pounds will make a huge difference in their lifestyle. You can see this on shows out there that we see on, uh, on TV. Uh, the Biggest Loser, Extreme Makeover, these things. Just losing a little bit of weight, all of a sudden these people have different personalities. Their health problems don't uh, interfere with their daily activity as much. And they go on to start this cycle, if you will, that gets faster and faster as they lose more and more weight. They feel better and better and better. And then a long-term maintenance programs have a much better success the no maintenance program. The problem is when you order some kind of special diet off the latest diet fad off the internet, the problem is that you pay for that for a certain period of time and then you have no maintenance afterwards unless you're going to pay for it for the rest of your life. So those are the maintenance programs that we talk about. Well, there's a couple of different surgical options, if you will. Uh, one of those is, of course, the adjustable lap band, which we'll talk about a little bit here in a little while. There's gastric bypass, which is a more radical procedure where you actually bypass the stomach with the intestines, and it causes a new stomach to be formed, or what we call a neostomach. That's about 30 cc's. That's six teaspoonfuls. That's what we want you to have as far as a neogastric pouch. And then we bypass some distance of the intestines so you get an absorptive issue. So you can have uh, electrolyte problems, you can have vitamin problems, these kind of things. So there's some problems with that option. One of the other newer operations is a laparoscopic gastric sleeve where we tubularize the stomach. We don't do any bypass procedure, but we tubularize the stomach so you want to take in less. But it also causes a dumping syndrome so that food's directed out of the stomach very quickly, causes a, a diarrhea, if you will, from a dumping syndrome where you dump carbohydrates that aren't completely digested out into the GI tract. They're not absorbed. They cause an osmotic diarrhea. And a lot of people with Gastric bypass had this as well, but it causes you to basically want to shun away from carbohydrates. So people with gastric bypasses, that's why they lose weight very quickly, is that they do not like carbohydrates anymore. They can't stand the diarrhea associated with it, so they immediately stop eating them, and they lose a lot of their weight. Now, the problem is, as they learn to eat around this over a few years, they wind up gaining a lot of their weight back. But sleeve operations are new. Uh, the whole premise of this is you want to cause stretch of the stomach at the top part up here, right up here. So if you can stretch the top part of the stomach, you suddenly feel full. All right, so you have to fill up the stomach the entire way. So here's my little stomach model. And if we have to fill up the stomach, excuse me, from this part here all the way back to here, you see how much food it can take. And the stomach undergoes a relaxation process. So it, it's like a woman's purse. It can expand and keep everything in there. Uh, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger over time. But if you somehow cause the top part of the stomach to stretch early on, you get feeling full. So that's what this gastric bypass does by creating a small pouch. That's what the sleeve operation does is the stomach fills up very rapidly. And also what we do with the gastric uh, band. <clears throat> Now, as far as complications, this is the first thing you should look at when you look at any operation is whether I should have it done or what are the risks and benefits. So it's like a seesaw. When the risks outweigh the benefits, you should never have it done. If the benefits outweigh the risks, then, of course, you should have it done. But if you look at the different operations, we're just comparing gastric bypass and laparoscopic gastric band. Total complications in gastric bypass is about one in four patients. That can be anything from major complications which are about 2%. When I mean major, it means you die. Okay, that's, that's the major complication. That's about as major as you can get. Up to short-term mortality of about a half percent to long-term mortality from either absorptive problems or problems that you can't handle anymore by GI uh, correction, and then you wind up dying late stage. But in the laparoscopic band, it's a relatively safe operation. Now, 2% may not be a lot, okay? If you think about it, we take 100 people who have a gastric bypass, two of them die. All right? Uh, if we take 1,000 people that have a gastric band, two of them will die from some type of major problem. 
may not have anything to do with the GI tract, maybe a clot in their leg during surgery, these kind of things. So this is a fairly safe operation. All right. Now, how did we go about developing a program here at Archbold? I went to administration several years ago, about eight years ago, and asked them to start one because I had done some metabolic surgery and training. Uh, at that point, I was not convinced that lap band was the right thing to do, but I knew that obesity problem was out there. We decided not to pursue this at the time because we didn't feel like we were ready, and we had several other things that were going on at the hospital at the time. We wanted to pursue more. So then we went back to them after some of the long-term literature came back on the lap band, after the five-year literature, where we started seeing the success rates and the safety issues that we saw at that point. And therefore, we started to investigate more. And about two years ago, actually, I'm sorry, two and a half years ago, Dr. Cascone and myself, one of my partners, investigated this very, very in-depth and went through the whole process with the hospital and came up with the program that we have today. What we do is we undergo an integrative evaluation with our medical side, our medical doctor who, who runs our bariatric weight loss program. There's a nurse manager that goes on and, and gets into the program, keeps demographic information, keeps you abreast of what's going on with your evaluations. We undergo a nutritional evaluation and support with one of our dietitians who specifically is our bariatric dietitian. You have to undergo a psychological evaluation to see if there's any problems that are making you eat. Is there a psychological issue that we can take care of that will keep you from gaining weight? Are you having an eating disorder? These kind of things that we can adjust and you have no real business being in an obesity program, you have some other problem that we can adjust and take care of. Then we look at emotional support. Do you have the support at home? Do you have friends and family that will hold you accountable? And you are, are in a group that, that can hold you responsible? Surgical intervention we do just with the lap band at this point. And, of course, we have post-operative nutritional support, ongoing group support as well. And I'll talk about each one of those phases in just a little bit. So who qualifies for surgery? And this is what I meant you would have to know BMIs. Now, this is standard qualifications, and this is not always true anymore. This was original, originally back before January 1 of uh, 2011. So it changed about 18 months ago. But currently, most rules will tell you, and most insurance companies will tell you, if you have a BMI of at least 40, okay, remember that normal weight is less than 24.9, so you're around 100 pounds overweight, then you qualify. If you have a BMI of, less, of at least 35 and you have one comorbid problem, do you have knee problems or osteoarthritis? Do you have reflux, sleep apnea, hypertension, diabetes, heart disease? Any of these things will qualify as a comorbid condition and will lower the threshold down to 35. Actually, the FDA indications for this operation, as the government sees fit, is you can qualify immediately for a BMI of 35 and if you have a BMI of 30 and have one of these comorbid problems. So it's actually lowered down because this is the only thing, surgery, that has shown very successful late weight loss long-term without health problems. And then qualifications vary again with each individual insurance company. You must be at least 21 years of old for our program, the actual FDA indications. You can use a lap band in someone down to the age of 15. It's the only thing that's been shown to also cause adolescent weight loss and keep this off for a long period of time. And then you must be prepared to attend regular follow-up sessions and make some lifestyle changes. This is a lifestyle change. This is not, I'm going in and having a drive-by surgery and I'm going to lose weight and I'm going to be beautiful afterwards. It is a complete change in your habits, complete change in even some of your friends. It is a complete change overall. Uh, and we have to look at things like this. And it's, it's very difficult and long-term how we look at things, things you can't even imagine. I've had an obese patient become really almost, you know, she's, not, she's no longer obese. She's only overweight according to the scales. But she looks tremendously well. She looks very different. And this caused some significant marital issues now with her husband because her husband is normal size. He doesn't like her being normal size because he knows that other people are probably looking at her, you know, and so that it causes a lot of issues. You never realize these until you start to uncover and peel back the layers of the onion that's called the disease of obesity. It's a significant problem. We're going to make you come. If you get into our program, 
You're going to follow up with one of the doctors at least almost every month. You're going to follow up and you're, going to, you're required to come to our uh, support groups. This is not Alcoholics Anonymous. This is Carbohydrate Anonymous. Okay? We're coming because you, most people are addicted simply to carbohydrates in about 90% of the cases that we find. So what do you do? We have a free screening by one of our nurses, our nurse manager, to see if you're appropriate and eligible to get into our program. This doesn't even include the LATDAM program. This is just our obesity program, if there's other things that we can help you with. There are more people in our medical side of our obesity program than there are in our surgical side of obesity. We're not trying to do just surgery here. Initial medical evaluation, that's done by Dr. Mansberger, our medical side who is a former surgeon. He knows what we need as far as surgical indications and what we're looking at, but he's doing the medical side of this. Uh, psychological evaluation by one of our psychologists or psychiatrists. They do a very extensive evaluation. They look at food choices. They look at your eating habits. They look at do you have any type of underlying problem? Do you have any hidden issues such as binge eating and purging, these kind of things. Final medical clearance and ultimately going to a surgical consultation with either Dr. Cascon or I, and then a dietitian visit, which will basically get into how to eat, how to eat after the band, what you're going to go through with the band if you have the band, and what you have to do beforehand. We have a preoperative diet that has to do with shrinking the liver so we can actually do the surgery immediately, and there's a lot of things that we'll talk about there as well. Well, what you do, and I already mentioned this diet, is a low-carbohydrate diet two weeks prior to surgery. I mentioned to you the amount of carbohydrates in a banana. Someone was talking to me before the program started. A banana is almost 30 grams of carbohydrates. It's actually about 24 grams of carbohydrates or a medium-sized banana. So that's one banana, maybe a one-and-a-quarter banana a day that you could have if you were eating just bananas on your carbohydrate diet. But about 1,000 calories, about 80 grams of protein, two to three high-protein shakes per day, no starches or fruits whatsoever for two weeks beforehand. You have a schedule. We only eat when we're on schedule. We don't eat when we're off schedule. And we begin an exercise program. We start to look at grocery shopping for our post-surgery diet phase and drinking at least 64 ounces of water per day. We really would like it to be more. What this does is shrink the liver of carbohydrates and fats immediately, and the liver can actually shrink, and we've got CT scans to prove this, about 50% of its size in just two weeks. So you'll lose somewhere between around five pounds and up to 20 pounds within these two weeks that you're on this special diet. It's not sustainable for a long period of time trying to eat 1,000 calories because this is pure willpower and knowing that the surgery is very important. Because if we do the surgery and your liver is not applicable to the surgery, we have to stop. And so now we've stopped the surgery before we've ever done anything. We have done this before, and we will do it again, I'm sure, when people don't believe us in what we talk about as far as the liver is very important. So usually when a patient wakes up in surgery after the lap band, they don't ask us about the surgery. They, they ask us how was their liver, because at that point if they say well, it was good, they know they had the surgery at that point. All right, so what we typically do with an obese patient is make around four to five incisions, sometimes six. We, uh, sorry, these are here. Usually we do a, almost a straight across approach now. Instead of the five you see here, we do four across the abdomen and one small one. We've moved this one up here to the top part of the right rib cage. We do it on a camera type operation. It's a laparoscopic. We immediately close you and you typically stay with us overnight. Um, this is the lap band position. Now this is the esophagus as it goes through the um, diaphragm. A lot of people will have a hiatal hernia because of reflux, if they have reflux symptoms, we'll go ahead and do a hiatal hernia repair as well. So immediately your reflux should be cured after the surgery. Um, we put on the band and we form this neogastric pouch here, about a 30 cc pouch. We take a couple of sutures to placate the stomach or suture the stomach over it so the band will not slip or go anywhere. That's one of the complications is a band slippage. And through years of experience with the, with the band surgeons in the country, They've come up with these sutures here to hold these, the band in place. At that point, and we'll show you a little video real quick. And it'll self-narrate itself. I thought, well, I will do it myself. 
The band is, a, is an omni-inflation band, which means that it inflates all these little pillows that you see here. They're all connected through a port. The port is accessed with a special needle, a non-core needle, so you cannot do this with a standard needle on the street. It has to be a special needle or you'll ruin the band. The band comes in two sizes. Uh, it has these little pillows here again that, that are a t special type of plastic that actually will not damage the stomach. And when they inflate, they inflate uniformly all the way around for closing off the esophagus. And so it's 360 degree omniform inflation, which causes a smooth reduction in the stomach size to form this pouch. Now we can check this in pressure in the office. We can inflate it to a certain amount. We know everybody's kind of good zone, if you will, where they do the best on each one of these. Now, once we inflate it, again, this is two different sizes, and that has to do with uh, certain size men really get a, a larger band because their stomach's bigger, and it would take us longer to get to their good zone, if you will. So when we put the band in, you see the big stomach here. We slip the band around the stomach through a minimal dissection area. It requires a little bit of dissection. It's not always this clean inside. We form the little neogastric pouch, and you will feel a little bit of restriction immediately after surgery. It's like you'd had a, a, a reflux operation. We put in the port, and we implant it in the skin and the stomach so we can feel it, and that's where we inject through. Now, we start to inject usually about four to six weeks after surgery, slowly taking you up. We don't immediately slam you full of fluid so that you can't eat or, or only will throw up. So you'll see this increases here. So as you see the representative food come through, without the band restriction, it goes through a lot. But once you start to restrict the band, you get this neogastric pouch to fill up, and that causes the stretch receptors in the stomach to signal the brain that they're full. So one of the things we want you to do when you eat is not drink. If you'll look at animals, go home and look at your dog or cat, they eat, they only eat, they don't drink. And so what the drinking does while we eat is we wash foods through our stomach into our small intestines that are barely digested so that we don't get full. So that's why we can eat longer. And so it takes us longer and longer to get full, hence we eat bigger meals. So once we've completed the surgery, you're in the hospital typically overnight, or some people go home, you do a post-op check in about two weeks, first lap band fill about six weeks, and again, maybe in certain cases, four weeks. We've been pushing the four-week window because usually at about four to six weeks, people start to gain a little weight and they start to get discouraged. And so we want to keep them trapped, if you will, in the psychological uh, aspect is I'm doing good, I'm still losing weight, I feel better. We want them to continue to lose weight. So we put a little bit in at about four weeks. Physician visits about six to eight in the first year. Uh, we don't always fill you with those visits. We actually almost tend to see everyone about 12 visits a year uh, to keep up. And then once we see you losing weight, you, know, you may lose 50 to 80 pounds in a year. At that point, we want, we want you to understand where you are, where you're going, and have goals set so that we don't require you to come in to see us as much. We, come in, we require you to come by and weigh a little bit, so we want you to keep responsible. And the more that you take ownership of this, the better you'll do. Several dietitian visits, uh, again, periodic lap band adjustments, and then we have our monthly lap band support group. Different topics, different topics. How to shop after your lap band. How to shop and survive during the holidays. How to eat at a dinner party. How to eat when you go out to a restaurant. What to order. What about cosmetic surgery after losing weight, loose skin, these kind of things. What about um, uh, how to deal with certain things like swallowing pills or doing things that you may find difficult. Um, we also have, we had our one-year celebration in July for our first seven people who got surgery the very first month we were open to hear their stories and see their success stories. All total, we've lost over 2,000 pounds in the last year with our band patients, and that includes the 39 that are done. So you can do the math yourself and see how what the average weight loss is over that time. So gradually, we'll increase your food variety. So after surgery, if you're having no problem, no nausea, we don't want you to throw up a lot if you, if you have a band and you're sick from the anesthesia. But if, if you're doing well, we'll immediately give you all the sugar-free, clear liquids that you want after surgery. And we, we basically cut you loose on that. So you can have 
uh, jello. You can have juices uh, that are sugar free. Um, you can have water. You can have crystal light. These kind of things that are that, that really don't have a whole lot of calories. And then we slowly advance you over the next two to four weeks to full liquids, cream based things. Uh, a little bit of pudding, if you will, sugar-free snack pack pudding, those kind of things. Pureed foods and soft foods and solids, and on up. We teach you how to eat again. You know, if you think back, as, as I think everybody in here is probably old enough, but if you think back to when I was a child, our dinner plates weren't as big as the dinner plates I have at home now. They were smaller. If you look at the average paper plate, that's about the size of a real plate used to be 20 years ago. So we try to get you to eat on smaller plates. If you go out to a restaurant, you know, you go out to a restaurant and they have a platter that used to be able to serve multiple people at one table to serve just you. So we get you to learn proportion size again. We teach you tactics like going to a restaurant and ordering an entree and packing half of it up to go home with and only eating half the meal, these kind of things. Uh, we continue with the protein supplements, shakes, bars, protein-enhanced foods. There's tons of it out on the market, and a lot of it is really good. Uh, protein food with every meal, we stress that. Protein is what fills us up, keeps us full longer. Because the carbohydrates cause a quick spike in blood sugar, we feel immediately hungry about an hour and a half, two hours later. Protein is slower digested, takes longer to get out of the system, so we don't feel as full. Meal size, about four ounces, por uh, four ounce portions. We choose solid foods over soft, mushy foods, anything that will go through a band quick. Okay? You don't want to eat mashed potatoes. We want you to cut up a harder potato, have to chew it, get some texture in your food, these kind of things. Um, never drink and eat at the same time. I've already mentioned that. That is a big no-no. We want you to stop drinking for about 30 minutes to an hour after each meal. Some people even say two hours. I don't think I can handle that myself. But it keeps you from washing that food out of the Neo pouch so you suddenly feel empty again. Um, we look at nutritional support is great. We have our own dedicated dietitian that deals just with our bariatric patients. She understands. She's horribly motivated. Um, she's wonderful. She's almost overly enthusiastic sometimes. She gets around me. I have to calm her down a little bit, uh, but she's wonderful. And she really knows how to look at the world through someone with obese eyes because everything you see out there is advertising food. Everything we do is related to food. You know, you go to church, they're having food at church. You go to any kind of social function, they're having food. And what is bad is when we go somewhere and someone offers us food, we don't want to decline it because we feel rude. And so she'll teach you how to get through those things. We have a, an exercise program with the YMCA that we have two classes per week with a YMCA instructor, one day a week uh, at gym access. This is free to all the lap band patients for six weeks after they start for recovery. So you can see if you like something like that to get you motivated. We have, uh, we're trying to contact other areas uh, in Thomasville, such as uh, other fitness groups, to see if they would let discount uh, or short-term memberships so people can try out their facilities, see if they like it, get involved in a program. They're more likely to stay involved in that program at that point. We have an integrated medicine YMCA program. For flexible times, it'll show you how to work the exercise equipment. Uh, it uses one of the physical therapists from Integrative Medicine where our medical side of our program is located. And then three to four weeks is paid by insurance and then an option to join ultimately the Y oftentimes if you have that insurance option with you. So we really provide a complex, or excuse me, a comprehensive program for a complex problem. It's not as easy as just pushing away from the table or anybody could do it if you had a little bit of willpower. Uh, we all meet about every two to four weeks to discuss patients. We keep track of people. We know who's telling us stories. We know who's canceling their appointments. Oh, they, you know, they had a sudden meeting at the office. They may have gained a couple of pounds that week. They don't want to face us. We understand these problems. We deal with this constantly because several of us involved in the program have dealt with this our own lifetimes. We have been heavy, and we've ultimately lost weight. We want to look at a long-term maintenance program with you. We're going to change your lifestyle, and you're going to begin to hate us, if you will, because you're going to see us so much. We'll, we'll cheer you through your successes, and we'll also tell you this isn't right. You knew you, what you did when you got into this. You wanted to do this. Reinspect your goals. Look deep inside yourself, and ultimately go back 
and, and, and win a greater success. Um, really effective, I just want to talk about the, the, the lap band itself. Uh, this is some new data. Uh, if you look at about 50% of the patients lose more than 50% of their excess weight. So if you have a lot, if you're 100 pounds overweight, we can get, at least get you to lose 50 pounds of that and keep it off for a long period of time. This is up to 24 months, if you will, and this is the percentage weight loss. At about 50% of their excess weight at about 18 to 24 months, they'll be gone. We want you to lose about a pound and a pound and a half a week. We don't want you to lose too much more. The radical things you see on TV are problems. Everybody's seen Biggest Loser before. It's wonderful. I even know one of the contestants myself personally. Uh, wonderful people. They've had life-changing experiences. But everybody's not afforded what they have. They have 24-hour doctors you never see on the TV screen. Uh, I was at a lap band meeting in Texas and ran into the entire show and recognized a couple of the contestants. They didn't want me to talk. They didn't want to talk to us. We got pictures of us with them. And they were fixing to run a 5K the next day. But they were about six weeks ahead of where they are in the show. And so they didn't want anybody to take pictures and get them out on the Internet of them. But they understood we were there to combat the same problem they were having. But they didn't have, you know, we don't, if I could give everybody that experience, I would. But that's almost impossible for you to leave your home for six months and go on without your family and do things. This is a practical approach to what we do. As far as resolution of comorbidities, 78% of people off hypertensives. 92% decreased or off all their diabetes medications. I have one of my best success stories in the last year. Um, is now no longer technically obese. There's a code that I have to use for obesity, and she is no longer obese. When I had to change that on my computer in my office, I walked into the into her room that day and gave her a big hug, and she didn't she didn't realize where she was at, even though she's a nurse. Um, and she was on five different diabetic medications, including an insulin pump. She's now off all of her medications except for one, and she's one of our best success stories about diabetes, sleep apnea about 95% cure rate or at least reduction in their usage of extra equipment. Uh, one of my also my great success stories is diagnosed with sleep apnea six months before her surgery, had to dial up the pressure on her CPAP machine when she sleeps out at night. She's now down to lower than what she started and hopefully will come off that machine within the next six months. Gastroesophageal reflux disease, 75% cure rate. Really, in all honesty, almost 100% cure rate uh, almost everybody's off their medications for this, but they still have an occasional reflux sensation. And sometimes this means that the band is too tight, too, if they have repeated reflux issues. I'd be happy to entertain some questions, but before I do, I wanted to give you all a chance to look at the model. If you all want to uh, take this and pass it around, I'll be happy to let you do that. And I'll be happy to take any kind of questions that you'd like to ask me. Any sugary product, juices, um, anything that's got extra sugar in it, uh, different types of sports drinks have extra sugar in them. And that sugar will cause you to immediately have an elevated blood sugar. It's quickly absorbed from the GI tract because it's in liquid form. It causes your blood sugar to spike, which feels really good in the brain. And then all of a sudden when that blood sugar crashes, you suddenly feel hungry again. So you want to eat or drink something else. Now, if you look at the uh, addiction of cigarette smoking, if you notice any of your friends, if, if they smoke, maybe you'd smoke yourself. I'm not going to ask you to admit that. But if you see one of your friends that smokes at work, it's about every 45 minutes to an hour they get this itch and they got to go smoke. So they go smoke a cigarette, and it causes a dopamine surge in the brain. At that point, they're satisfied. They're they're They've got that dopamine surge satisfied. They can concentrate. They can reset themselves again for about 45 minutes to an hour. What we tend to do is go eat something one hour. We feel hungry again an hour later. We go drink something that hour. We go eat something the next hour. And we're doing this constantly throughout the day, almost like our cigarette. We're getting our fix for that sugar. So anything that can get sugar into you very quickly in its simplest form causes these problems and ultimately leads to, dive, to uh, obesity and diabetes and things. That's why you're seeing a lot of interest in schools and school-aged children right now where they're getting these sugary drinks out of the classrooms, out of the cafeterias, where a lot of people, even the own, 
the, the companies themselves are promoting this to get these sugary drinks out of the schools while the kids are at school. Any other questions? How long are you out of work? It's a great question because everybody, you know, again, I told you not everybody can go away for six months to, to lose weight. Typically, and in most of my experiences with Archibald employees because I see them back at work, is usually one week. Uh, we do our pre-op stuff several weeks beforehand, so that's all taken care of in afternoons, you know, maybe slipping away from work early a little bit. Once you have surgery, then you typically are out for about five business days before you go back. Now, there is some issues if you do very strenuous work, uh, heavy lifting, things like that, we may restrict you immediately, but typically I've had people even go back in about three to four days to a desk job. Sure. Is there any, the question is any noticeable uh, or visible visibility of the port underneath the skin? Really no. What we tend to do, it's not like a, a port you see maybe in a cancer patient that may be very thin and it's up at the top skin up here in the chest. We intentionally want people to see those because they want them to start IVs in those. This is not for an IV, of course. This is for us to inject just fluid in for the band. But we do it so that it's deep enough in the fat above the muscle that allows it to be hidden, and you can't see it. Of course, you can see the incisions now, and depending on how you scar is how much you're going to see those incisions. But we can actually palpate and feel the port, know what the port feels like in certain positions, and then we can access it from that point. But you really don't see any visible sign of the port whatsoever. And in fact, the port that you're passing around is one of the old ports. It's what's called a high-profile port. We actually have one that's about half that size now. They make it a little harder to access sometimes because it's harder to feel, but it's a low-profile low, uh, uh, port that allows us to really have no problems once you lose a lot of weight. We, uh, the question is, is it hard to swallow medications uh, afterwards? Um, we typically put people on a couple of things after surgery. Um, we will change a lot of your medications over to things that can be crushed if we have to use them because we don't want you to swallow very large pills. Um, you know what the size of like a, this is bad to bring up here, a miniature M&M &M is? Of course. Okay. <laughs> Not the regular size M&M. &M. It's probably a bad question to ask. Right? Well, a miniature M&M &M is about the largest size uh, that we want you to swallow. And when, we, when, when you leave the hospital, we typically give you three different things to take in addition to some other medications of your own. We give you Finnegan tablets in case you have a little nausea. It also helps with esophageal spasms. When you work on the esophagus, it tends to spasm like any other muscle does for several days after surgery. So we'll give you those. Those are tiny, about the size of a miniature M&M. &M. That's the biggest thing we want you to take. Liquid Benadryl, you can buy over the counter. Helps with esophageal spasms and some nausea as well. And then we give you a liquid pain medicine if you need pain medicine. And you can also take liquid Tylenol or liquid Motrin like you would for your children. But most of the other medications we can crush are they're either small enough to be able to swallow whole. Some medications we do take you off like vitamins. We have other vitamins. There's certain gummy vitamins you can chew. Uh, there's certain liquid vitamins if we need to go that route. There's other vitamins that are very specifically made for lap band patients or gastric bypass patients that are very small, that are very concentrated, and you can ultimately use those as well. So we'll work around each one of your medications. Now, a lot of medications, you may be suddenly coming off very quickly, so we don't want to change too many things because we're going to try to get you off those medications as fast as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. Well, um, good question. Um, do you keep your band after you've achieved your weight goal? Yes. We would like you to. It can be removed if it has to be. That's one of the advantages of this operation is it's totally reversible. And, in fact, from a reversibility standpoint, I can take all the, the fluid out of the band if you're having problems. Or let's say you need to come in and have surgery for some other reason, and they need to put a tube down in your stomach or put a tube in to temporarily drain your stomach. We can take all the fluid out of the band, allow them to put that tube in there, then when you're done and back to normal from that operation, we can immediately refill the band back to normal. Um, one of the advantages of the band is there's about, if I remember correctly, um, I wanted to say 600, I think, known pregnancies with a lap band, maybe even more these days. That was several years ago. In fact, I know of one person in southwest Georgia who has a lap band that's had two successful pregnancies after lap band. In fact, a paper was published uh, two years ago with a condition called polycystic ovary syndrome uh, that has hormonal issues because of cysts on the ovaries. 
the only way 100% of the people in the study became pregnant was with a lap band or with an obesity operation that lost a lot of weight because the weight is part of the issue. With extra fat, it causes peripheral estrogen production, which can cause interference with your own hormones and ultimately lead you to be infertile. Uh, and so that's where they were having this. They were using this as a solution to the infertility associated with some of these hormonal issues. So I know, of, again, this one particular person I've actually operated on that they, when they had their band for something else. And um, they've done fine. They've had their uh, band refilled after surgery, losing weight again after their latest pregnancy, which is about a year ago. So we do ask you to keep it. We don't want you to suddenly go back to old habits, which a lot of people can do. How long do you have to avoid walking and just some basic exercise? Um, as soon as I can kick you out of bed. I'm not kidding. I want you to go back and do some normal things. We want you to walk after surgery because it promotes a couple of things for us. It clears your lungs out, as we normally do every day when we're moving around. Uh, the other thing it does is prevents clots in your legs. We, uh, we give you several things to prevent clots. We also give you some little cute stockings to wear. We want you to wear those for a minimum of 48 to 72 hours after the surgery. Um, so we'll do several things to help you out in that respect. But that's one of the things that we fear from being sedentary is clots in the legs, those breaking off and going to the lungs. That's how, believe it or not, most of the lap band people that I've heard that have had uh, deaths associated with their programs, most of them have been from pulmonary emboli. And it's a big problem we deal with every single day. And so we were very, very conscious of that problem. Very, we won't, we're going to beat on you about that. So we do want you to move around very quickly. Now, as far as going running or doing some other things, it's going to take you a little while to build up to that. But we would like you to go out walking. In fact, the quicker you can develop an exercise regimen, and hopefully you've already developed it before surgery, then you will continue that after surgery. We're not trying to, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel right after surgery.